Hmm. A HD remake of Final Fantasy VII. I don't know. Not only is it taking way too long to make, but I've already got the original game. I just don't see what it's going to bring to the table. Ah, oh my god, I need this now! Inject it straight into my veins! Final Fantasy VII is, by far, the most popular game in the entire Final Fantasy franchise, and the first mainline game in the series to get a European release. It finds itself on the higher spots of many best video game of all time lists. It is the second best selling PlayStation game ever, and helped make Sony the gaming monolith that it is today. It spawned multiple prequel and sequel spin-off games, as well as a film sequel. Its protagonist, Cloud Strife, has had an untold number of cameo appearances in all kinds of different media, most importantly serving as Square Enix's sole representative in Super Smash Bros. 4. The dramatic plot twist of this game is hailed as being gaming's equivalent to No, I am your father. And frankly, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir right now. You know how popular this game is, so why am I spending all of this time labouring this point? Well, it all begs an important question. Is the original Final Fantasy VII anywhere near as good as people can test? Or is it overrated? Let's finally put this heated debate to rest. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's, that's not the direction I'm going in either. Final Fantasy VII has had such an overwhelming cultural impact, and it has sparked so much discourse in the past 20 years, that even that one controversial talking point has now been exhausted. And guess what the conclusion was? It's down to personal taste. You can't prove that Seven is objectively better or worse than any of its counterparts. Nor should you tell somebody else that they are wrong for liking or disliking the game more than you do. Some of you may be wondering, do I prefer Six or Seven, since those two are always compared to one another? Well, I love both of them, but if I had to pick one, Six. In fact, I prefer 9 to 7 as well. 9 is super charming. But none of this which Final Fantasy is the best one nonsense really matters. It would be a crying shame for me to dismiss Final Fantasy 7 for such a flimsy reason, as it is still a ridiculously good game, and I intend to explain why. Besides, as long as we can all agree that 2 is the worst, then I'm sure we can all get along. More than 200 animators and programmers. A multi-million dollar production. Over two years in the making. And a cast of thousands. They said it couldn't be done in a major motion picture. They were right. Final Fantasy VII. Final Fantasy VII goes all in from the moment you start the game. You are immediately treated to an at the time groundbreaking FMV sequence, which cleverly transitions into a gameplay sequence. Compared to anything we'd seen beforehand, this made you feel like you were playing a perfect hybrid of a game and a film. Visually, it's kind of laughable how much the characters look like disproportionate Lego people outside of battles, but looking back, these blocky PS1 3D models have an irresistible charm. So the game starts with Cloud, an ex-soldier who finds himself wrapped up in mercenary work. Hired by Avalanche, a group of eco-terrorists, you start the game by committing a bomb attack. Ugh, are you sure they're re-releasing this game in the modern day? So, after committing yourself to these acts of extreme violence, and getting back to Avalanche's base of operations, you meet up with your childhood friend, Tifa. And once Tifa joins you, something becomes immediately noticeable. 
there are only three character slots. Seven is the first game in the mainline series to deviate from the tried and tested party of four, possibly due to memory or processing limitations. And it makes quite a big change to the dynamic of battle. Unlike the previous Final Fantasies where having a dedicated healer, mage, thief, warrior, etc. was a good idea, I find that it's better to spread your party a little thinner in this game, especially considering that, for the most part, the game balances itself around this. You see, as you continue your rebellious activity, you'll run into little coloured orbs referred to as Materia, and Materia can be directly applied to your character's weapons to immediately imbue them with commands, magic, summons, or passive abilities. These can be added and swapped with ease, making it easy to mould your party members into jacks of all trades. Sure, they all have their base stats allowing them to excel in certain areas, but thanks to the influence of Materia, you can make your squad really versatile. What ends up separating each character though, are their unique Limit Break attacks, which are easily accessible, satisfying to execute, and blow the Final Fantasy VI equivalent desperation attacks out of the water. I love Limit Breaks, they are one of the best additions to the Final Fantasy formula. Anyways, I never did explain who Avalanche is sticking it to. In the city of Midgar, where a good portion of this game takes place, there is a very clear class divide, and the oppressive faction that holds power over everyone is Shinra, an electric power company who have a monopoly on Mako energy, which just so happens to be harvested from the planet's tangible life energy. It is fueled by the circle of life and death. What's that kid? Your grandpa died? Oh no. Oh well, I'm gonna use this soul to power my coffee maker. So Shinra aren't too far removed from Final Fantasy VI's Esper Harvesting Empire. But while the analogy there was one of extreme racism, Shinra's is far simpler to grasp. Mako Energy is pretty much fossil fuel, a non-renewable, highly damaging source of energy that threatens all life, and Avalanche are actually doing their bit to save the world. The bombings are intended to stop Shinra's harvesting of Mako, but this all backfires when Shinra violently retaliates. After several misadventures, the party, now including a kind-hearted flower girl named Eris and an escaped test subject named Red 13, find themselves captured by Shinra. Only for the game's real plot to kick in. So, it turns out that Shinra are harbouring a disgusting, headless, parasitic alien named Genova. Shinra once used the cells of this omnicidal alien to create super soldiers, with their crowning achievement being the legendary Sephiroth. As you later discover in a playable flashback, Sephiroth kind of lost his shit several years before the events of the game, driving an inexperienced Cloud to kill him. But in a rather disturbing twist, Genova takes on Sephiroth's form and starts wreaking havoc. And I'm not gonna lie, Seeing this bloodbath unfold as a child was nothing short of terrifying. Shinra's president is horribly murdered, his son Rufus takes over, and the rest of the game has you both running from Shinra and pursuing Sephiroth. And I think that this, this right here, this is the point that most of your average gamers' minds were blown. You see, it's only at this point that you get access to the world map, which to a Final Fantasy veteran is no big deal. But Seven spends a long time in Midgar, an oppressive, closed-in industrial environment, which gives very little indication that there's actually a grander world to explore. So to suddenly have the world open up like this, it must have been huge for people. And it probably served as one of the reasons that Final Fantasy VII received such colossal praise. Anyways, 
From there, the game becomes more of a standard adventure. You expand your party with a bunch of interesting characters, with some being completely optional, and you visit all sorts of interesting places, with my favourites being Cosmo Canyon, Fort Condor, and most importantly, the Gold Saucer, a theme park where you can lose yourself to a bunch of mini-games and side quests. And that's not even getting into the chocobo breeding, the chocobo racing, the snowboarding, flying, creative boss fights, and the daunting super bosses, Emerald Weapon and Ruby Weapon. There's a lot to this game. However, there is one defining moment that most people take away from this experience. Sephiroth is established to be quite a threatening chap, to say the very least. But in one fell swoop, he goes too far, and he makes things personal. He murders Eris, which not only traumatises Cloud, making him even more of an emotionally closed off edgelord, but it also deprives you of one of your best party members. Aeris' limit breaks healed and buffed the party, and with a smug grin on his face, Sephiroth takes her away from you. Oh, and to punctuate this moment, you are played one of the most heart-wrenching songs in the game's otherwise energetic soundtrack. Thankfully, Eris' materia isn't lost because that would be some Final Fantasy 2 bullshit, but the urge to murder this dickhead becomes stronger than ever. And things just escalate further from there. Cloud, by this point, is revealed not to have been an ex-soldier after all, but rather another victim of Genova cell experimentation. As such, Cloud is susceptible to Sephiroth's influence, and has to deal with a lot of mental abuse and manipulation, which at times can be really upsetting to watch. But eventually, Seth reveals that he wants to drop a huge meteor on the planet, and the last stretch of the game revolves around stopping him. At the end of the game, when you finally confront him, Seth uses his Genova cells to shapeshift into weird abominations, and is eventually inspired by his own messiah complex to take the form of a one-winged angel, which also happens to be the name of the iconic track that plays when you fight him. So, after a fairly tough fight, you get the most satisfying possible climax. A scripted battle in which Cloud beats the ever-loving shits out of Seth. Oh, uh, and the world is also saved, I guess. Yay! So, that's Final Fantasy VII. It was a groundbreaking success, it still holds up, and I am stoked, I, I am beyond stoked for its remake. Looking back at it, Square could have just kept repeating Seven's design and formula to basically guarantee success in their future endeavours, which is why Final Fantasy VIII proved to be such a shocking departure. Coming this fall, the most anticipated action adventure of the year. A story of one man's struggle to save mankind from extermination and his quest to win the heart of the woman he loves. An epic so stunning your emotions will stir, your heart will race, and your thumbs will be really, really sore. Final Fantasy VIII, coming to a home theater near you. So, you all know that I like dunking on Final Fantasy II by this point. I'm pretty sure that I've done it twice already in this video alone. Just to remind you, right after concocting a winning formula and creating a Final Fantasy game which received colossal praise, Square decided to get all... experimental, 
creating a follow-up with a bizarre character growth system. In 2's case, this turned out to be a huge disaster. But in 8's case, they ended up with a game that kind of works. It was kind of fun. It left most people with mixed feelings. And it left me wondering about the merits of innovation for the sake of innovation. I like this game, but I wouldn't go so far as to say that I love it. When you first start, you get a big flashy FMV sequence, just like Seven had, but where the opening of Seven seamlessly transitioned into gameplay and threw you into the action, this sequence comes to a climax. It hits you with the title, and it peters out. And then you're left here. Here's our hero. He's in the nurse's office because he got a cut on his face. Well, back to class, I guess. Yeah, this game goes for a completely alien setting, far removed from any other Final Fantasy game, or any piece of media that I've ever seen. You play as Squall, a moody student at a military school. And when I say military school, I don't mean like full metal jacket, drill sergeants, drop and give me 20, lights out at 10 o'clock military school. This is more like a standard Japanese high school slash university, I think? You know, with sit down exams and smart uniforms and a relaxing atmosphere. But also there's one facility where monsters roam free and if you go there you'll probably be eaten by a T-Rex. Also the first thing that you're required to do in this game is head to a nearby cave with your whip wielding teacher, Quistis, and beat up the fiery guardian force Ifrit so that you may junction his power through you. And if it sounds like I'm talking nonsense right now, then boy howdy, you are in for a ride. The word experimental doesn't do this game justice. The design ethos of this game seemed to be throwing an entire olive garden's worth of spaghetti at a wall and keeping all of it, whether or not it actually sticks. And that's the thing, once you finally wrap your head around this game's bizarre world and mechanics, there's quite a fun experience in there. But until you have that eureka moment, welcome to Spaghetti Hell, where enemies level up just as you do. Certain attacks require timed button presses. Magic spells are a tangible commodity, which must be hoarded and bound to your individual stats. Unskippable summon animations go on for way too long, Rend yourself bare and drown in that delicious spaghetti. The aforementioned Eureka moment comes when you realise that you can break Final Fantasy VIII really early and exploit this otherwise difficult game to make it comically easy. As I said, enemies level up with you, and that includes bosses. So if you play a load of card games early on, Refine the cards that you win into overpowered magic using one of your guardian forces, bind that overpowered magic to your low level characters, essentially breaking them, and then proceed through the game fighting as little as possible, going so far as to remove random encounters when you get the ability to do so, you end up with a curb stomping simulator, and a vehicle for a very confusing plot. And on that note, it just occurred to me that the only way I can present the story of this game in a coherent manner is to brush aside the surreal elements and put things in layman's terms, so that's what I'm going to try to do. In this game, you play as Squall, my least favourite Final Fantasy protagonist. Sorry to anyone who likes him, but god, he is such a brooding misery guts. I give a pass to Cloud because his life is super horrific and he's justified in being emotionally closed off. But Squall just comes off as needlessly rude. He comes off as arrogant, aloof. He's just unlikable to me. His only saving grace in my eyes is his gunblade. I like the gunblade. It's cool. Anyways, you play as Squall, a rookie mercenary who is sent out on a bunch of missions. And this 
is easily my favourite chunk of the game. There's a mission early on where you're being examined for your performance, and every little thing you do is assessed. Your ability to follow orders, your capability in battles, and your ingenuity in outsmarting and escaping from this giant F of spider tank. The game quietly logs all of this down, and it is used to decide your pay grade. I loved this, and I wanted it to be the game's formula. Especially considering that the next mission has you hijack a train, and battle with a fake zombie president. That is literally a thing that happens. But, just like Final Fantasy VII, everything gets flipped upside down after encountering the game's central antagonist. Who in this case, is an evil sorceress named Ultimecia, who possesses another sorceress, named Dia. Uh, okay then. After botching an assassination attempt on Idea, Squall gets impaled by a shard of ice, and everything that happens afterwards is so absolutely gonzo that a lazy internet theory about Squall dying and the rest of the game being his hallucination is accepted by many as canon. No, for reals, I cannot summarise the rest of this game's plot in a fashion that doesn't just devolve into word salad. Delicious word salad to go with the spaghetti. So instead, I'm gonna do something a little different. I'm just going to list five things that happen throughout the course of this game. And if it sounds so ridiculous that you just have to know how these events come to pass, although the answer is probably time travel, then I encourage you to play this game for yourself. Number one, Squall floats through space to save his romantic interest. Number two, Gilgamesh from Final Fantasy V appears from an interdimensional portal, and he beats a guy up. Number three, no! Number four, Squall's necklace is the penultimate boss. And number five, the whole game takes place inside a stable time loop. I think. I'm... I'm not actually sure about that one. Time travel stories are complicated. You know what, how about we just murder the time manipulating witch? I mean, you know, what's the worst that could happen? Final Fantasy A is weird. Next. Hmm, maybe I'm overthinking this, but I don't think I played the right advert there. Final Fantasy IX is easily my favourite to come out of the PlayStation trilogy, and it also happens to be the personal favourite of Sakaguchi, the series creator. In a lot of ways, Nine pays homage to the older Final Fantasy games, scrapping most of the recently introduced sci-fi elements in favour of a more traditional story. The cartoony art style is bright, vibrant and colourful, and it looks really lovely when ported into HD. The music is sublime. The story is... well, it's much more coherent and engaging than 8's was, and most of the characters that you meet throughout this game are likeable and memorable. 
Oh, and the battle system? It's nice and simple. It's about as user-friendly as Final Fantasy gets. No materia, no junctioning, just a bunch of characters with different jobs and standard levelling up. And yet, the game's balance and design are so flawless, it never gets boring or frustrating. It is sufficiently challenging throughout, and that is bloody impressive for such a long experience. Anyways, story recap. When the game begins, you get a relatively short CG opening, which transitions seamlessly into gameplay. This is how 9 deals with most of its CG cutscenes, which are spread out throughout the game to complement its pacing. Once you take control, you are introduced to the Tantalus Theatre Troupe, a group of actors who secretly operate as thieves. After establishing that they've been hired to kidnap a princess, we then get another CG cutscene, which segues to the perspective of a friendly little kid named Vivi, who looks and battles like a classic Final Fantasy black mage. Vivi is the coolest. So, playing as Vivi, you explore the kingdom of Alexandria, which is quite a departure from anything in Final Fantasy 7 or 8, with its medieval European architecture and its cartoony residents. You make friends with a rat boy named Puck, who offers to help you sneak into the theatre troupe's upcoming play. Once you succeed in that endeavour, you're then thrown back into the shoes of the actors, and the play that they're putting on as a kidnapping distraction actually serves as a battle tutorial, with special effects instead of real deal magic. This is cool enough on its own, but it then leads to a QTE sword fighting mini game. I kind of adore this. After one of the actors, Zidane, starts infiltrating the castle, and incidentally runs into the princess who already seems to be booking it, you are then whisked into a whole new perspective, one of Steiner, a hilariously uptight royal knight who is tasked by the queen to run around the entire castle and find the escaped princess. This shifting perspective could have been really jarring, but I actually kind of love it. It helps to give us a taste of the wildly different personalities and backgrounds of our, well, soon to be party members, and the way that they finally tie together and culminate in this chaotic slapstick mess of an escape scene, it is glorious. As it turns out, Princess Garnet, who later goes by the alias Dagger, wants to escape her evil mother, and willingly chooses to join her would-be kidnappers. Steiner objects, which leads to quite a ridiculous clash, and then in what can only be described as an absurd comedy of errors, everyone accidentally ends up on stage, having to blag their way through a performance and then Vivi is chased on stage by a guard for having snuck into the show, and then the stage starts to fly away, much to everyone's distress, and then you get another fight with Steiner, who doesn't realise that this huge bomb is behind him, and oh no, we're all going to crash into the evil forest! Whew. From this corker of an intro, you've probably gathered that Final Fantasy IX is a lot more comedic than the other Final Fantasy games, probably on par with 5 in terms of how wacky things get. Well, that's one thing that I love about it. It sets up this light-hearted story in which a bunch of dashing rogues, a spunky princess, an oafish knight, and a very confused child end up on the run from a ridiculous looking evil queen. Really though, what's, what's with the blue? Why, why the blue? And in the face of such a silly, comedic, dare I say, saccharine tone, most players will drop their guard, which allows the horrific, miserable, existential horror of this game to hit them all the harder. Final Fantasy VII started dark and ended dark. 
8 started weird and ended weirder. But 9 sets you up with a full on bait and switch, going from cute to horrifying. The world of Final Fantasy 9, Gaia, is ravaged by war, and on your travels, you get to see it firsthand. Thanks to the evil queen and her flamboyant arms dealer, Kuja, there is a whole lot of death in this game. Just heaps of murder, a wealth of destruction. This is all beautifully complemented by the personal struggles of your party members, with the three most tragic being Dagger, Vivi and Zidane. Dagger is used by her mother to extract the power of Eidolons. I Eidolons. Eidolons. Summons. Summons. And is even prepared for execution after outliving her usefulness. She later has to deal with seeing her kingdom being obliterated right in front of her. Vivi learns that as a black mage, he is one of Kuja's artificially created weapons of war, with a total lifespan of just one year, of which he has six months left. And then you have Zidane, the selfless, upbeat, roguish hero, who discovers that he too is an artificial construct known as a genome, created by an android named Garland, who wishes to see Gaia assimilated by a dying planet named Terra. There's the sci-fi. Zidane, and Kuja for that matter, were created by Garland to assist in Gaia's destruction, serving as angels of death, and well. When Cloud gets upset, that's kind of expected. When Squall gets moody, well, when isn't he? But when Life of the Party Zidane has a playable emotional breakdown in which he lashes out at the people who care about him and he grows to detest his own existence, you have one of the strongest moments in the entire series right there. I wasn't quite brought to tears by this bit, but I was definitely shaken. That There was something going on in that heart of mine. Around this point of the game, Kuja, who at this point has already backstabbed the Queen, flies into a narcissistic, omnicidal rage when the subject of his own mortality is brought into question. He kills Garland, and under the pretense that neither world deserves to exist without him, he travels back in time to the Crystal World, the source of all life, with the intention of ending all living things before they are even conceived. So with that in mind, you end up in a final boss fight with an obscenely powerful Kuja. And once you've pushed him to his limit, he uses the last of his strength to wipe your party with his world destroying Ultima attack. Everyone dies and they find themselves in an abstract realm, which I can only interpret as being a hell. Here you engage with the real final boss, Necron who is apparently a fan of the Star Wars prequels? What? Why? Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. Anyways, Necron is the embodiment of death. And most people think that this climactic encounter with him is pretty weak, coming completely out of left field without any explanation or justification. Weirdly though, I kind of like it. This plot, more so than even Final Fantasy X's, is driven by the theme of death. The inevitability of it, different people's attitudes towards it, and the inherent futility of life when we're all going to die anyway. Sorry if this is getting a bit too real. This fight doesn't have you killing death itself because that would be contradictory at the very least. No, at best you are just trying to incapacitate him so that your characters can revive themselves and return home. Thank you. 
So, leaving you with the ominous message that he is eternal, Necron buggers off, Kuja has a somewhat redeeming moment in which she assists with your escape, and you get a fairly sweet ending. Except for Vivi, obviously. But, you know, that's death for ya! So there we go, all the mainstream Final Fantasies recapped and reviewed! Well, aside from the MMOs, which I don't play. Or 12, which was fine. Or 13, which was naff, but did have improved sequels. Or 15, which I haven't played yet. Anyways, here's my Patreon. Anything that you can spare will be hugely appreciated. I've been living off of watery porridge and pasta for the past few days, so... A few quid would be very helpful right now. Anyways, thank you to all current patrons, and for everybody else, see you later. Bye!